Over to you. Okay. Uh, this one. Timer. Okay. Hey, great. So, hello everyone. Good morning. Uh, my name is Greg. I'm the uh, digital design lead at, uh, at Low Risk. Uh, my first time at Orconf, first time at Munich. It's really, really great to be here. Um, some of you probably know quite a lot about low risk. Some of you probably never heard of us. So, so this talk's just going to be, first of all, a bit of a, a talk about what we do, uh, as well as giving an update on kind of latest activities and, and kind of plans for the future. So, what is low risk? It's a, uh, it's a not-for-profit organization uh, that's dedicated to uh, enabling the commercial adoption of, uh, of open silicon. It was founded in the, uh, out of the Cambridge Computer Lab in 2014 by uh, Alex Bradbury, uh, Robert Mullins, and Gavin Ferris. Uh, and I believe, actually, they were here, or at least Alex was here at Orcom 2014 to, to kind of announce the foundation. Uh, so some nice history there. And what we do is we uh, employ collaborative engineering to build open designs. And by collaborative engineering, I mean we get multiple, uh, generally quite large companies, so we partner with people like Google, um, their engineering teams work with our engineering teams to build our, our designs in the open. And the idea is we're trying to build something that's actually credible to industry, so they're happy to kind of pick up what we're building and, and ship it in actual products. And a key, a, a, a key part of this is you know, functional RTL, just having some system bell log of your CPU core, whatever, that works. It, it's just the starting point, really, if you, if you actually want to convince someone to pick it up and, and use it in a real chip. Uh, so, so one of the key things you need to do is to have a uh, uh, DV, design verification. It's, it's absolutely crucial. Um, and there's an awful lot of work you need to do here in order to actually hit your kind of commercial tape-out uh, quality standards. And then there's a bunch of stuff that goes along with this DV. So you want collateral, things like test plans and coverage plans. Um, you need uh, regression results uh, and, and regular regression runs to kind of demonstrate that you've hit the standard, you know, you've hit the coverage standards that you need. Uh, you're running a good number of tests and also that the project is healthy and continues to, you know, be passing your test suite. And then you also want to make sure you've got high quality code, you want to make sure you've got good documentation. Uh, we, we have a bunch of style guides describing how we think you should write a uh, system bell log for, for synthesis. For, for DV, uh, and you know, also I think we mostly just use the Google C++ style guide, but you know, we, we, we adhere to certain style conventions in all the coding we do. And we're developing something we're calling the Silicon Commons. Um, this is just the name we've given to, to, to kind of common working practices uh, that we think are the way you should build open silicon. And ultimately what this really is, it's like just a hardware spin on, on existing open source uh, working practices. All the way over here, right. <laughs> so, what projects do we do? OpenTitan is our, is our major project. Uh, and what OpenTitan is, is it's uh, what's called a root of trust. Uh, or you might think of it as a, a secure microcontroller. So it's got a bunch of uh, different blocks in there. Some of them are security specific. So we've got a bunch of crypto blocks, things like AES accelerators. Uh, we've got some more standard peripherals, things like I2C, USB, and so forth. And then we have a RISC-V core, uh, IBEX, which I'll talk a bit more about later on, uh, that kind of runs all the software for this. And then OpenTitan is being built by a, uh, a collaboration of, uh, of, of companies along with the low-risk engineering team. So we've got people like Google, uh, Western Digital, Seagate, uh, Revos, RISC-V Startup, Winbond, uh, ETH Zurich, uh, and so on, who have, who have kind of all contributed in various ways to, to, to the development of OpenTitan. So, it's, and, and as, this is kind of our primary project, uh, and it's a major driver of what we do. And the reason for this is because OpenTitan is, is it's a pretty easy sell to the industry for why they should worry about open silicon. The reason for this is, is the technology we're building here is important in a lot of places. So, you, you see uh, root of trust um, is, you know, you. You would, they're already vital in things like data centers and servers. You will see them on things like laptops, desktop computers. You may well have heard of TPMs, trusted platform modules. O OpenTitan could implement a TPM, and you see, you see you know, Microsoft mandating one in Windows 11. We also see this kind of technology going into things like mobile phones. It's also present in things like smart cards and credit cards, uh, SIM cards, 
Um, it's also going to start appearing in uh, Internet of Things. As everyone knows, the S in IoT stands for security, because the security is terrible. Um, and more worryingly, uh, IoT is also being turned, you know, there's a thing called operational technology, which is basically IoT for industry. So where IoT runs all your industrial processes and your utility grid. Clearly, that needs significant security. So there is a lot of interest in uh, Open Titan technology in, in these applications as well. So there's a lot of people who want this stuff. Um, and, it's, and it's expensive and hard to build good, good solutions here. And of course, there are plenty of existing proprietary solutions. But they tend, um, they, they tend to be very closed down, uh, very hard to kind of learn about, can be hard to trust. So, uh, um, you know, if, if you want to buy certain secure microcontrollers, you might not even be allowed to, you might not even be able to buy them, you might not be able to easily read the data sheet. So even, even, as, even like large companies like Google can, can struggle to um, really understand what it is they're, uh, they're, they're trusting with security of some of their most critical infrastructure. So you will note that Google did indeed build their own in-house uh, route of trust called Titan, which incidentally isn't really linked to Open Titan other than the name, and they're both <laughs> come out of the same company in a sense. Um, but most companies don't want to have to build a route of trust, and Google didn't really want to have to build a route of trust. It's expensive, and you have to keep maintaining it. And, and ultimately, they don't really care about building routes of trust in this technology. They want to build stuff on top of it. So this is where Open Titan comes in. You get multiple companies coming together, all contributing resources, so that means money, principally, as well as a bunch of other stuff. Um, and in return, they get a very high quality, um, uh, high quality uh, IP base that is maintained and they can use and trust uh, a far lower cost than if they built it in-house and ultimately probably higher quality as well because you've got more people coming in to build it. I, I don't think I really need to sell you guys on the benefits of open technology, but Oh, uh, but the, uh, the application areas of Open Titan are a particularly easy place to sell the benefits of, uh, of open technology. And, you know, uh, Open Titan has potential to become like a, an actual major part of shipping silicon across different sectors, which is, you know, very exciting. If we, if we can pull this off, be a significant demonstration of the, uh, the value of open silicon to industry. And I'm hoping we can shift the conversation from people saying, why, why would you use open silicon in design to like, well, why aren't you using open silicon? Look, it's on GitHub, it works. It's used in you know, tens of millions of devices. Why, why are you buying this you know, proprietary thing? So where are we today with Open Titan? Um, we've actually uh, taped out uh, our first engineering sample, uh, which is it's a discrete chip known as Earl Grey. Uh, it's in fab now, and it's going to be back later this year. Um, consists of uh, over 30 individual blocks uh, and they've all got kind of very mature and significant verification behind them, run nightly regressions, thousands and thousands of tests. I think there was about 40,000 tests to run last time I checked. Uh, and it's a very active project on GitHub. You can see um, roughly the last month there on the, uh, the Insights page, had kind of 35 contributors, kind of in the hundreds on, on pull requests and commits, issues, PRs, around about 1,000 file changes, and over, over five years, had 140 unique uh, contributors, 13,000 merged PRs, 20,000 commits, and 1.5 million lines of code. So there's, there's a lot of stuff here. And then finally, I, I'm not going to dive into the details of this, but this is just a, uh, a top, uh, an overall block diagram of what is in an open Titan Earl Grey. And all of the blocks that you see here have been developed from scratch in the open for open Titan, with the slight exception of Ibex. As I said, we'll get onto that. Um, and, you know, if you want to learn more about this, well, it's an open project. You can go on our website. Um, there's actually a clickable version of this diagram that tells you kind of how many tests are currently running and passing and all that kind of stuff. And you can click through and look at, look at all the documentation. And then, of course, you can go on to GitHub and look at the actual RTL. You can look at the DV. You can look at all the firmware that can run it and so forth. So where are we going with Open Titan? Um, Key thing to realize here is that this Open Titan Earl Grey is, is just the beginning. This is not the final destination. We're not like, great, we've done Open Titan. This is stage one, demonstrate that actually, demonstrate what we've built to industry. And there's still significant work to do on that chip. So when it gets back from uh, fab, there's a whole bunch of kind of silicon characterization, post-silicon validation, and also extensive security validation that needs to, you know, we're going to do some of that. And there's also going to be third-party labs uh, doing some of that. 
And uh, what, the, we built OpenTitan intentionally so the individual blocks can be used um, outside of OpenTitan. We have this thing called the Comportable IP Framework that kind of enables that. And we're already seeing people pick up blocks of OpenTitan and use them in other things. So if you saw uh, Amp Micro's talk at the RISC-V Summit uh, in Europe uh, a few months back, you, they, they had a nice demonstration of a, of a, of a system builder they're putting together. And, and part of the IP library that is provided there is, is taken from OpenTitan, which is fantastic. And as you saw yesterday, Calyptra have, have picked up some of our blocks. I think they've got our AAS block and maybe some of the non-security peripheral blocks. I can't quite remember now. And they're, and they're using it, which is, which is great. And so the future work in OpenTitan is starting to focus more on OpenTitan integrated. So this is where we take the OpenTitan technology and we put it into other things rather than just tape it out as a discrete chip. Um, so major thing we're doing there, uh, integrate it into to a larger, larger high performance SOCs, be using kind of data center and uh, other server applications. And, and behind the scenes, work on this is actually been going for quite a while. So um, that's, that's actually fairly far advanced. Can't really share anything publicly, but you know there are no, you know got got a got kind of a notable design uh, in, in the background there, um, and then kind of at the other end you've got op uh, using open title in things like SIM cards. Uh, you know a lot of excitement around embedded SIM and integrated SIM. Well, it's a lot of excitement. If you're in a very nerdy kind of security certification and mobile world, a lot of excitement, um, and open title could actually be very valuable there. And then I already kind of talked a little bit about I, how there's a lot of interest of this in IoT and operational technology. And certification here is absolutely vital. Um, and what, what certi certificates you need kind of vary between applications, but there is a challenge there as, as an open source project. So for common criteria security certification, uh, you get scored points on, on various things, and you actually lose points for having open RTL. So we kind of start at a disadvantage. Uh, versus versus other designs. Um, <laughs> so we uh, we we you know we think we think we're we're confident we can overcome that. But you know that is uh, in our future uh, get, getting this through certification. It will be very exciting to be able to certify uh, uh, cert get security certification for for this open design. And yeah, as I said, work is ongoing on these paths right now. Uh, sadly, none of that that work is actually out in the public domain yet. It will be, and that will you know. Uh, include full repository and all of the history, what have you. And this kind of mirrors the very beginnings of OpenTitan. So OpenTitan actually started as a repository called, I think, the Software Silicon Transparency Working Group or something. Um, and I think it lived in there for about a, about a year or so before, we, before the public launch uh, in late 2019. So that's OpenTitan. What else do we do? It's a good question, uh, and the answer... <laughs> Um, uh, so, uh, past few years has been well. To be honest, it's all about Open Titan. But we we are we are working on things that are not Open Titan, or at least partially not Open Titan. Um, I, I would mention at this point that we do have a software team, uh, but I'm I'm one of the hardware guys, so I'm not really going to talk much about software. In particular, there's a bunch of work uh, we do around the LLVM, LLVM compiler and RISC-V backend. I'm not the person to talk about it, so so I'm, I'm not going to discuss it here today. I, I should just flag up that that exists. So I said I was going to tell you about IBEX, um, and so what is IBEX? It's our it's our RISC-V CPU core. Uh, so uh, RV32 IMCB, so that's integer, uh, multiply and divide, compressed instructions, and uh, bit manipulation, along with various other uh, extensions to, to kind of mostly support our, our security uh, applications in OpenTitan. Um, so we have uh, EPMP, so PMP is physical memory protection. It is, uh, a fairly it is a fairly basic um, just set of regions and access permissions, and EPMP is like the latest version of it that adds a bunch more uh, capabilities that are actually very important for enabling uh, secure boot on OpenTitan. Um, we've got full debug support. Uh, we've got an instruction cache. You can kind of configure between a two- or three-stage pipeline. We've got a variety of security features, which I'm not going to delve into, but I, I will highlight we've got dual-core lockstep. So this is where um, two cores are placed together. They get fed the same inputs. They should thus give the same outputs. And if they mismatch, there is a fault, which in a security um, environment kind of means that you've got an attacker trying to, uh, trying to inject faults. You also see this used in safety applications where you're worried that a cosmic ray has just um, blipped a vital bit in your processor. And IBEX is highly configurable. So, um, you know, as I said, you can choose two or three stage pipeline. You can kind of choose whether or not you're including uh, EPMP, whether or not you want the instruction cache. Um, 
whether or not you want bit manipulation. There's multiple different uh, implementations of the multiplier or no multiplier, depending on how much you care about multiplication versus uh, multiplication performance versus versus area usage. And a bit of a cheat here, I said like, what, what else that we don't do that's part of OpenTitan? Well, IBEX kind of is part of OpenTitan in in particular. Uh, you know. All of this development on IBEX occurred because OpenTitan exists and funded it and needed this, this RISC-V core. Um, but there's a lot of interest uh, and use of IBEX outside of OpenTitan. And because it is so configurable, you know, you can turn off all the security features, ignore them. Um, and then it is uh, a very capable um, embedded core uh, that you can use in all kinds of things. And it came to us uh, for, from the Pulp project, actually where it was uh, called Zero Risky. So initially developed at ETH Zurich. Um, so they contributed it to us, I think, around 2018, 2019. Not entirely sure, to be honest. Uh, and we've been doing major development on it since then. So that's things like reformatting it all to, uh, to conform to our style guides, uh, ensuring it's lint clean. Um, been doing a lot of work on documentation. And then a lot of the work has been on the DV, the design verification. Um, so we have a very comprehensive test suite, run nightly regressions on that, and you know we, we it's it's basically hit production tape out quality. So you know, hitting high high 90s in in coverage metrics across various code coverage metrics as well as functional coverage, where you know we've got a few hundred cover points and cross cover bins and all this stuff. Um, uh, so yes, that that's kind of one of the major things we've been doing on Ibex. So in a sense, you could say Ibex is done, but you know I. I Projects are never done. Uh, there's plenty more we can be doing. And I, with IBEX, I'm trying to, certainly in the you know, traditional uh, CPU IP, um, you, know, you look at, say, ARM's product line. Um, you know, there's, there's a new release every year or two years, and that gives you some new features. I, I'm trying to say with IBEX, we're not you know, doing the IBEX 247AB and then the, the IBEX 7822 or what have you. It's, it's just IBEX. It's very configurable, and you can set it up how you like. So plenty more we can be doing. So first of all, we need to kind of, there are lots of activity in RISC-V extensions, and we need to kind of keep up to date with these. So you know, there's, uh, I think, debug uh, version 1.0 um, is finally getting ratified soon. We're actually on the, the current ratified version, which is not version 1. It's 0.13, I think. Uh, the, the privilege spec keeps getting little point updates. Uh, so I had to update it as to the latest one six or so months ago, maybe a year ago. I can't quite remember now. Um, and then there's things like new, new extensions. So there's um, recent development, which I think is actually going to be very important for embedded applications, uh, are new code size reduction extensions. So these are mostly just new 16-bit instructions that aren't you know, particularly revolutionary. But there's also some new compound operations that aren't really your traditional RISC-style operations, things like push and pop. These are, these, are, these are a bit more of a challenge. They're a bit more complicated to implement, and they're also potentially significant impacts in DV, because you, they're going to introduce new control flow paths into your pipeline, which can have interesting interactions. You know, what happens when you have an exception halfway through, halfway through a stack operation and that kind of stuff? Um, so that creates a whole bunch of new coverage points you need to hit. Uh, probably need to write some new tests. Uh, might need to play around with a test bench in certain ways. So potentially quite a bit of work there. And then there's kind of a bunch of major extensions that we, we can look at implementing. You know, obvious use cases for things like floating point, Small vector units are actually quite popular on embedded cores. Um, the ever popular uh, AI at the edge uh, can, could utilize small vector units. And you've got more traditional applications, things like DSP, kind of your normal uh, things like control algorithms that, that can benefit from, from having vector units. Um, we've got the scalar cryptography and entropy source extensions that we, we had a presentation on yesterday. Um, you might think, aren't those really perfect for OpenTitan? And the answer is maybe. So. Um, Within OpenTitan or Gray, we, we don't need those extensions because everything, all of, everything that provides that we need is implemented in, in our accelerator blocks. However, you might want to do another configuration of OpenTitan, but perhaps a smaller one, in which case an IBEX that has some of these things as, as instructions rather than needing a, an entirely different accelerator could, could be a very useful thing to have. Other thing we might consider doing is building a 64-bit IBEX. Um, when I've, I've seen, when I've, initially heard of this idea, I thought it was a bit crazy, why do you need a 64-bit small embedded CPU core? But, but the reason people are interested in this is people use IBEX as uh, an embedded controller in, in larger SOCs. And of course, a large SOC has a full 64-bit memory system. So when you put a 32-bit RISC-V core in there, you need some kind of 
translator, some kind of bridge that bridges its 32 bits into the 64-bit system. I mean, these are easy enough to configure, but it's an, extra bit of, it's an extra bit of hardware to deal with, and it's also an extra piece of complexity for software to worry about, because it has to set up the translations and all these kinds of things and make sure. And then if the microcontroller needs to be able to talk to a whole bunch of stuff in the address space, you maybe need to shift translations around or have complex maps. So if you just have a 64-bit IBEX, then you can just plug it straight in on the side. Obviously, you're still going to need some kind of memory protection, but you're now working in the same address space as your main system. And that just makes life easier for, for the software guys. So there's actually quite a lot of interest in, in building something like that. We've got the fast interrupts task group um, um, approaching a ratification on a standard there. That's kind of interesting because there's a couple of bits to it. There's, well, there's a, there's a whole software side as well. But on the hardware side, you're implementing things in, in the CPU core, but you've got uncore stuff as well. So you've got kind of new ways to implement interrupt controllers to, to work with these fast interrupts. And so if we build something like that, it's, it's very important that we, uh, we build an implementation that's easy to, to, easy to integrate, because there's no point building the thing if it's entirely mysterious or impossible for someone to be able to take the interrupt controller you've built that works with your fast interrupts implementation and integrate it into their system. So there's you know, um, things there outside of the RTL and DV that you need to consider for that to actually be useful. You could also look at topics around things like multi-core. Uh, so you know, introduce atomics, uh, maybe some kind of data cache. Uh, all, all good computers should be able to run Doom, um, and I have yet to run Doom on IBEX. This is principally because it's a bit of a pain to do unless you have a nice data cache, because you know, Doom needs a few megabytes of memory. If I had a data cache, I think I could get it up and running quite quickly. So that's, I think, a good reason to implement a data cache on IBEX. Um, but ultimately, what we do is driven by our, our partners. Um, so, because some things, uh, you know, are small enough to just do ourselves, so you know we can we can just justify doing them um, because they're they're actually not too hard and clearly obviously useful. I think things like the code size reduction extensions and the fast interrupts probably fall into this category. Whilst we don't have you know a, a precise plan to be doing these in the next, you know, we're definitely going to be doing this in the next six months. They are they are definitely things I want to do uh, pretty soon. Um, and then other things are, are, are really quite a major investment. So implementing, say, a vector unit, um, doing that 64-bit IBEX. Um, there, you know, what we really need is for external partners to come along and say, like, hey, I need this. I, I can support you guys. Because one of the things we want to do is ensure that we, we don't really like to do the build it and they will come. You know, we want them to come to us and then we will build it. Um, because you need to make sure you're building something that is actually relevant to industry and, and someone's actually going to pick up and use. Um, so we like, we like partners to be able to put their hand up and say, yes, I would like this. So, other thing, uh, new project, uh, which is exciting, um, outside of OpenTitan, uh, all built around a thing called Chariot Ibex, which is something that, that Microsoft built. So, so what Microsoft did is they took the, the Cherry uh, instruction set, which um, has actually been implemented on MIPS, ARM, and RISC-V. Uh, this is obviously the RISC-V uh, variety. And if, if you haven't heard of Cherry, it, it implements what are called capabilities. So these use fat pointers. So these are large pointers. So I think uh, Cherry was initially possibly 256-bit pointers now down to 128. And in Chariot, they are compressed to 64-bit. So this means you suddenly need a 64-bit register file. But the reason you use capabilities is they give you um, fine-grained kind of bounds and access checking on every single memory access. Uh, and you know, this isn't a Cherry presentation, so I won't go into how it works. But the, the capability that you, you, everything must be accessed for a capability, and those capabilities are unforgeable. So you know, your operating system can give you a capability to access precisely the buffer that it wants you to write into. You attempt to write past the bounds, you get, a, you, you get an exception. Um, so it can actually just eliminate large classes of, uh, of kind of typical memory bugs that lead to, lead to security violations. Uh, I think Microsoft recently did some interesting work where they demonstrated that two-thirds of uh, security bugs in, in some system just wouldn't have existed if, uh, if, uh, if they'd been using Cherry. And, and here, uh, recognizing that embedded in IoT uh, have, have, uh, yeah, have high, are getting higher and higher security demands, Microsoft built this Chariot um, architecture um, targeted specifically for these kind of low-end embedded things. And nicely, they, for us, they, uh, they evaluated open source RISC-V cores uh, to implement it on and decided IBEX was the one to implement it on. 
we've been having some discussions with Microsoft about this, so you know we're we're in we're in uh, we're in communication with them, and we've ended up setting up a project that's been funded by UKRI, UK Research and Innovation, which are going to build platforms around the Chariot Ibex uh, to, to, to help uh, industry and academia evaluate how, how they might use Chariot in their, in their research and their designs. And this is going to include significant engineering work, uh, along with kind of a whole bunch of documentation and training materials. So what are we going to deliver out of this project? Uh, First thing, which I think is maybe the most, ex well, possibly the most exciting thing for me, uh, I will be done in a couple of minutes, I think I've still got some time, um, is, is we're going to be building a new low-cost FPGA board, uh, which, which can be used for evaluating Chariot. Um, and that's going to, part of that's going to be RTL to, for a full Chariot system. Um, we're hopefully going to use a Lattice ECP5 FPGA, and that would allow us to use a, to the existing open source uh, flow, I mean, new primary development using that open source flow. You know, I'm saying considering because um, this thing needs to work. <laughs> so um, if, there's, if there's issues with the flow, we will, we will flip to using Lattice Diamond. Uh, and we'll probably have Lattice Diamond support, but I'm hoping we can manage primary development with the open flow. We're actually looking for feedback on the board requirements here. So there's a, there's a little uh, URL you can go to, document there with uh, an email address in there that you can uh, feedback to. And, and as part of this uh, funding from UKRI, we're actually going to have 100 boards that we made available three, for free to selected organizations, we have yet to define uh, how, how we're going to hand those out, but there will be some kind of form to express interest, uh, and then we will, we will hand them out to the chosen people. And there's also going to be a version available commercially, likely through Mauser. Going to build a second system, which is going to combine Ibex Chariot um, with, uh, with the OpenTitan Earl Grey instance. This is for people trying to evaluate, um, well, who need the high security you can get from the root of trust uh, along with the chariot system. And neither of these things are going to be production ready, but we hope they're going to help evaluate uh, chariot technology for production use and potentially could be used as a base of a production chip. And of course, this is all open source. So in particular, low-cost FPGA boards, schematic and layout are all going to be available, um, I think, under Apache 2. I'm not entirely sure. Um, but I, I'm hoping this can actually be quite a useful board for the open hardware community as well. As, as well as its primary purpose is this kind of chariot enablement platform. Other thing we've built, uh, IBEX demo system. So th this is probably something that's good to look at if you're interested yourself in evaluating IBEX or playing around a bit of RIP. The wonderful thing about OpenTitan is it's, uh, it's a large open source um, proper actual silicon project that you can basically watch being developed live in a repository. But along with that comes a lot of kind of complexity and slight chaos. So it's quite hard to just jump into that, especially as an individual. Uh, Ibex demo system, nice simple thing that gives you an Ibex on a, on a low-cost FPGA board and crucially integrates things like a debug module with all the JTAG setup. And it actually can run everything via the, the single USB port on the RT, so that gives you the FPGA programming, it gives you program loading and interactive bugging as, as well as a virtual UART. Also got support for the new AE Chip Whisperer boards, and I, I am working on support for the Orange Crab, uh, which is an open hardware board uh, with a Lattice uh, ECP5 FPGA. I was hoping to bring that along and demo it today. Sadly, it, it's not quite ready, but it's, it's almost there. We also have some labs we developed for a Hypic workshop, uh, and there's also a Rust software stack you can play with that sits on top of it. So, here is the... <laughs> As I said, it's under the, so the orange crab board's actually in the top left here. That's a Raspberry Pi Pico I'm using as a JTAG probe. And yes, it blinks an LED, and that is Ibex blinking that LED. Sadly, the JTAG probe is yet to work. <laughs> um, so you can't load any programs onto it yet. I'm still debugging it. Um, I'm hopefully going to have that working in, in, a in, a, in a week or so, but not quite ready in time for here, sadly. Come on. And then finally, uh, Muntjac, which I suspect most people will not have heard of. Um, it's, it's actually a Linux-capable 64-bit core uh, that, that we have. It's available in our in repository there. It's created by students at the University of Cambridge. And, you know, it's, it's a nice little core. Um, so Gary, the developer, or primary developer, uh, has a, uh, a GitHub repository, has an example SOC, two-core Muntjac, boots Linux, DDR, Ethernet, display. Nice. Uh, I think it runs on the Nexus video. The reason we don't talk about this, it just sits in our GitHub for anyone who happens to delve into our repositories, um, it, it's a long way off production ready. This isn't like Ibex where we promote this as you should take this out on a chip. And the reason for this is we basically haven't done any DV work on it. You know, boot it, some people think, oh, I boot Linux, I can run applications, core work, great, right? Well, certainly when you look at commercial verification, that's kind of like 
stage one of, of your verification process. There's an awful lot more you need to do. Um, we have not done it. It's also got quite limited performance. I, in the sense, it's actually quite similar to Ibex. Um, obviously, Ibex can't boot Linux and doesn't have a data cache, but, uh, but yeah, it's, it's actually very low performance. So I, I don't know if it's below, high enough performance for, for what people might need. But um, I think there's some very interesting things we could do there. In particular, if you could maybe make a dual issue in order version of it, I think it would be a very compelling core. So no active development on it with Lotus right now, but it would really be great to find some partners who are interested in it and would be interested in supporting that development. So final thoughts. Uh, I think it's a very exciting time to be in Open Silicon. Um, there's you know, major developments in open tooling, uh, open PDKs, a bunch of people in this room who, who are responsible for, for, for that. And, and you know, I think we've already seen significant deployments of open silicon uh, in or shortly appearing in commercial applications. The problem is a lot of this just isn't visible. People don't realize it's happening. You know, uh, um, low risk do actually continuously talk to people who are talking about how they're using IBEX or they're using OTBN, which is our, our big num uh, accelerator that's used in OpenTitan or AES block or what have you in various different applications or, or are interested in evaluating it. I mean, I, and unfortunately, I can't share any of this publicly because it's all been kind of off the cuff conversations or, you know, under NDA, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I can't. Sadly, put up a slide and say IBEX in 100 million devices. But you know, I, IBEX might be in 100 million devices. I, I just don't know. Um, so one of the nice things about Open Titan is it's on track to being notable and crucially visible uh, deployment of Open Silicon. Um, and you know, we've got other groups uh, active and achieving great things in this space. Uh, again, some of them in this room. Um, and in order to make a bunch of, in order to make you know everything we do uh, at low risk happen, support from industry is is really crucial. And by support, I generally mean money. You know, we've got engineers to pay salaries for, we've got an office to run, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But you know, there's also other bits of support. Well, other support industry offices, things like engineering support. Uh, we collaborate extensively with other engineering teams, and that is vital to, to everything we do. Um, and then I think for specifically for people in this room, advocacy is, is really important. We need to make sure that people understand the value of open silicon and, and embrace it. So, you know, if you are in the silicon industry or, or, you know, you work with people in the silicon industry, have a think about how you can advocate for open silicon. Uh, can you persuade your team to, to, to evaluate the usage of it um, or, or get your team to use it? Um, I, that, that, is, that is kind of really how we move this stuff forward. So. Um, please do get in touch uh, if you want to know more or are interested in partnering with Low Risk. Info at is our kind of generic email address. It does get read, does get responded to, uh, and then the GAC there is, is my email address. And then finally, finally, quick hiring plug. Um, we are hiring, so if you're interested in working in Open Silicon, please, please do check out our jobs page. And that's it. So, thank you very much for your time. Cheers. Thanks, Greg. Okay, I have a comment and a question. Um, I think low risk, uh, I've got many comments and questions. But, um, <laughs> we, uh, we at Morse Micro use, Opa, uh, we've taped out OTBN and IBEX yep. in our chips, and they're fantastic. And we've actually implemented Atomics and even Trace support. And Ooh. I'll work with our guys to try and set up a PR for that. Okay, cool. Um, to maybe save you a bit of work. But I think the project is fascinating in the way that it did bring together kind of industry people and then you guys sort of as like the open interface to the rest of the world um, to, to sort of, you know, coordinate the work. And I think that that's a unique model and I, it seems to have gone well. Mm. And it seems that, would I be right in saying that the Calyptra project is kind of following that model due to the success of low risk? I, I guess so. I think, I think Calyptra, uh, you know, maybe set up their governance in a bit of a different way. But yeah, ultimately, uh, you know, they, they do use Open Titan IP, for instance. Um, so, so in a sense, yeah, yeah, I think they have, uh, have picked up certainly various successful aspects of the kind of Open Titan and, and low risk models to, to, to build that. Yeah. Um. So congrats on to you and, you know, Alex before you and everyone else in the low risk team. I, th I think it's been, been a success in that regard. Also, congrats on the tape out as well. Can we oh, just support you. the yes. tape out of Open Titan? Well uh, done, guys. Been a long, long time, time coming. coming. It was yeah. great to finally, finally get it out the door. <laughs> Should celebrate and congratulate every mm. tape out that we can get in the kind of open silicon community. Mm. So nice work. All right. And with that, I've hogged the microphone enough. Yeah, also, yeah, thank you for the great presentation. Uh, 
Uh, first question, how can I get access to early, uh, your Earl Grey tape out? Uh, how can you get access to our Earl Grey tape out? Sadly, you can't right now, uh, at least for the engineering samples. Um, we, are, we are hoping to have an actual production run following a successful evaluation of the engineering samples. But yeah, right now, there are no details I can really share on um, a accessing, the, accessing the chips. Um, yeah, uh, it's, it's kind of restricted to open Titan partners at the moment. Um, and I, yeah, I, I don't know the details of, of, of how the production device is going to be made available. Okay. Um, and uh, the demo project that you showed, right? Mm. So uh, with that, it would be possible to test the entire open Titan on, a, um, on an RT, digital and RT board? So you can run all of Open Titan on, on an FPGA. Sadly, it's quite an expensive FPGA. So the, the, the board we use at the moment is the new AE CW310. Uh, sadly, that has suffered from chip supply difficulties, so it has been very hard for people to get hold of them. Um, and we're actually uh, now supporting a new board from UAE called the CW340. And that you can pre-order on Mauser. I think you might be able to buy a CW310 on Mauser nowadays as well. But again, I think it's, it's kind of a bit of a pre-order. But finally, the chip shortage has allowed us to start cranking production. And certainly, the, the 340s are, are pretty much ready to ship out a new AE. Um, unfortunately, it's an expensive FPGA board, because uh, Earl Grey is quite, quite a large design. Uh, or, well, it's a tiny design compared to, you know, a... Um, uh, oh, have I accidentally done that? <laughs> oh, dear. Uh, that's how that works. Excellent. Um, so it's quite, a large, it's quite a large design, so it needs quite a large FPGA. Okay, okay thank you. So uh, I have a question. Uh, you have a lot of IP in, in OpenTitan, right? Mm. Uh, so how, how do you describe them in a, in a, like a two-leg agnostic way and handle the dependencies between Sorry, them? Sorry, I can't see the speaker. <laughs> ah, there we go. Um, how do you describe it in a, in a tool agnostic way? So we use, well, they, uh, uh, all, of, all of the OpenTitan IPs use, uh, use FUSOC. Uh, so they have FUSOC core files. Um, it, it is, you know, practically it can be a little bit hard. You know, um, we haven't quite reached the promised land of you can just grab an IP out of the open time repository and quickly integrate it into something else. You do have to do a little bit of work to tease it out of there. Uh, but FUSOC is going to make that easier. Uh, and we are kind of working on trying to make that as, as easy as possible. Um, but yeah, by, by using FUSOC, um, it can build. Uh, you, you can quite easily then build that core um, with different synthesis tools. Or you can uh, run it across uh, different simulators uh, and what have you. So um, by, by leaning on FUSOC, that can, that can do a lot of the heavy lifting for us. Uh, we also uh, use, we use Bazel uh, for software build, and that is also leaking into the hardware build. It is capable of many wondrous things. It's also quite complicated. So uh, yeah, still, still work on going there to, to, to really take advantage of, of uh, the kind of dual, uh, dual capabilities of, of Bazel and FUSOC. Uh, so hi. So um, when you do your uh, line coverage, what metrics do you what kind of language do you use for your verification? What kind of language do you use? We what use kind of li line coverage. Line coverage. Sorry. Line coverage. Line coverage. Yeah. Okay. So we um, we have multiple coverage. I mean, we, uh, the, the coverage metrics that we we monitor are just like the standard code coverage metrics you get out of um, you you get out of mo standard uh, DV tools. So kind of the synopsis and cadence simulators. Um, I can't remember precise line coverage metrics off the top of my head. It's certainly into the high 90s. Um, and, and our ultimate target um, will, will be 100% line coverage with, with waivers. And I think certainly in, if you look at IBEX, um, it hasn't quite hit 100% line coverage. Um, but when you look at the lines it's not covering, um, it's, it's kind of like dead code or unreachable code. Um, and yeah, we just haven't had the time to, to go through and sort out the waivers for those yet. Um, Cool. All right, Greg, we're going to leave it there. Oh, okay. oh, sorry. One last question. Okay, okay I'm here. Yep. Hello. Um, thank you for bringing up the certification. Mm. And basically, I had a couple of like questions there. So okay. One of the things is... I'll see what I can do. I'm not a <laughs> certification expert. Um, I don't know if he's around, but uh, he was around yesterday. Um, and yes, there we go. So Felix over there knows a lot more about Open Titan certification <laughs> than I do. <laughs> he doesn't look very happy now. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I mean... Um, one of the things I suppose it's quite expensive to certify mm. the chip. So mm. one is about the cost. So yep. is there some light or transparency who would 
like share the costs of the certification and also yep. you might uh, indicate the specific standards that you're certifying I guess. yes um, so to the, fir the first question yes it is expensive um, I don't know the costs off the top of my head I, I, I certainly can't reveal them publicly now anyway possibly it's something we could discuss in public it's one of those things that, that's kind of quite sensitive so open titan aims to be as as open as possible but also kind of quite pragmatic about it so there, there's certain things that ultimately end up having to be fairly private and certification ends up falling into uh, uh, one of those buckets uh, as to the actual standards i i can't actually remember off the top of my head um as i said man in the corner might be willing to talk to you <laughs> offline <laughs> All right, let's uh, leave it there. Thank you very much, Greg. Right. We appreciate that. Thank, Thank you. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you.